Thank you everybody for sticking around. I just wanted to make leading questions. Sure. Uh, and then there's going to be a question and answer for you. There you go. All good. All right. These lights are so bright. Uh, <laughs> no. Alex, should I start? Um, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll get things started as people you get their uh, refreshments and settle back in. Um, 
thank you all for, for coming out. Um, and uh, so my, I'm Carl Zimmer. Um, and um, after watching all these movies that have to do with time in one way or another, um, we decided to have a conversation about time with three people who have um, very interesting and very different experiences with time. Uh, and they're going to kind of share with us uh, their work and their ideas. And um, after, we, after we talk with each one of them, uh, there will be time for your questions. And we've got microphones over here. So if you have questions about anything from the weather to immortality and anything in between, just there you go. Um, so I've arranged um, uh, our panelists in order of time scale. Um, from the you know the minutes to the decades to this millennia, uh, so we'll we'll start with the shortest time scale, which is which is with Fernanda, um, and I want to just introduce her properly. So give me a second. So Fernanda uh, Viegas is uh, she is a computational computational designer, uh, and she is uh, best known for her data visualizations, some of which you may have seen on the web, and um, if the computers. Here, Google cooperate with us. We'll be able to show you some of them. Uh, and she currently leads Google's Big Picture Research Group in Cambridge, in Massachusetts. And her visualizations have been exhibited in uh, museums such as the New York Museum of Modern Art, the Boston Institute of Contemporary Art, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. So, Fernanda, um, why, don't you, uh, why don't you tell us a bit about the kind of visualizations you do and and how you, what's interesting about your visualizations? They're not just pictures. They're they're almost like movies, kind of like what we've been looking at. So you so you deal with time every day. So just sort of introduce us to your work. Sure. So I, as Carl was saying, is I, I visualize data, and I have to say I was looking at the video at the at the films, and every time there was a visualization, it tended to be very very geeky. <laughs> And so I'm hoping that we can get away from that a little bit. I really think about data visualization as a medium um, for, for expression that ranges between, you know, very, very scientific stuff all the way to artistic practice. And um, I don't know if we can bring up any of the visualizations we had, but basically in terms of time, one of the most exciting things to do these days, which you couldn't do before, is to visualize real-time data. Visualize something that is changing all the time and that when people go to your visualization, they know that they're going to get uh, some phenomenon or, or some information that is up-to-date to the minute. So if we can go Absolutely. to wind, actually, yeah. the first one. So this is, what, this is how I first got to know your work. Um, so tell us what we're looking at. So this is the wind right now. Um, across the U.S. and this is on the web for anyone to see, and it's it's uh, real time, and you can interact with it. You can zoom into your city. You can see, you know, how um, fast or slow the wind is going. But one of the things that was really exciting for me and Martin, Martin is my collaborator, was just to see how much the wind changes and just how different these images can be from day to day. This is really a dynamic system that changes all the time. So if we could go to the second um, tab, we're going to look at a, at a different day. And just to give you a sense of the range of things, so this is a day when the wind in the US, uh, all the air was being sucked up by <laughs> Canada. Um, can, you, can you tell us like where you get your data? Yeah, we get it from NOAA. So it's, it's public government data. And I have to say, it was really really nice to see your tax dollars at work uh, <laughs> because we have some of the highest um, resolution data in the world. And this is basically a quilt of sensors that are spread across the country. And one of the cool things, since this is a, a, an audience that's interested in science, is that each state has their own modeling of the data they get which makes it interesting when you want to visualize the entire US because it means that sometimes the modeling that happens in one state doesn't quite match with the modeling that happens in another state. So you, so you see a little bit of a boundary there. It's just a fact of, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of the fact that this is sort of being crowdsourced from all of the sensors that we have um, around the country. And if we could go to the very last um, tab on wind. Um, 
this was um, Hurricane Isaac making landfall. Um, and it was interesting because part of the response that we get to this data, to this visualization, is on days like this, as you can imagine, lots of people want to come and, and see uh, the map. And we'll get emails. We got emails from, from people in New Orleans saying, you know, we're looking at your map and we're just praying that this thing blows over us and is gone. And it wasn't until we had Sandy hit us and we were in the path of the hurricane that we realized just how powerful it is. I think we had never done a visualization that scared us before, and this is this is definitely one. Um, so... How, d how does so what I mean how how does the fact that you you can use time in your these visualizations how does that change things I mean we we see plenty of uh, just uh, diagrams of you know wind currents you know that are just pictures but somehow there there's something hypnotizing about this I mean what it, what do you think it is Yeah when we first thought about visualizing wind we were sort of kind of we were bummed a little bit because wind has been visualized for many, many years, for decades. There are specific ways in which you tend to visualize wind. You use uh, you know, vectors, and, and, and as you were saying, it's static images. So you have these little arrows that tell you where the wind is going. And so we're like, can we do anything that is different here because it's been explored? Um, and part of the huge process that um, we went through to get here was us experimenting with animation or static images, and all of a sudden we're like, no, you know, wind moves. It's it, the whole thing is that it, we want to see that shape. We want to see this form that changes and moves and is dynamic. And so eventually we got to the point where we're like, okay, animation is really important. Um, one of the things also about that is that the fact that we are animating and you can see these trails. Um, made it so that we could keep a lot of the detail of the data set um, and a lot of the complexity of the data set. So one of the things that happens in static wind maps is that you average a lot of what is coming out of the sensors and you have these little arrows so that you can actually make sense of, of the data. It's a lot of data. But because we're animating and we're leaving these trails, your eyes are doing a lot of the work for you. And it's very easy to see that, you know, the stuff that's happening on the west is different from the stuff that's happening on the east, and that there is stronger and um, not so strong wind. Um, so I feel like this is part of working with your eyes. It's speaking the language of your, of your eyes. But if you keep that open for a few hours, it's going to gradually shift. So there are these other time scales that it's working on, too. Yes. So one of the questions in our minds when we first did the wind map is, we're like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to do this. It's going to be real time. It's going to be great. And then we're looking at this, and we're like, no, we also need a gallery that shows different days. Hmm back historical gallery, just so you can see the, the diversity and how different and powerful it can be on any given day. Mm, interesting. Great. Great. Excellent. Um, okay. Well, let's um, let's uh, um, talk with Aubrey. So Aubrey de Grey, um, uh, uh, second to my left, um, he is a biomedical gerontologist. So he deals with the kind of time that we're not so uh, enamored with, you know, the time that brings us towards the inevitable end. Um, so he is the uh, the founder uh, the, uh, of the SENS Research Foundation, where uh, he's the chief science officer. Um, he received a BA in computer science and a PhD in biology from the University of Cambridge in 1985 uh, and 2000, uh, respectively. Uh, Dr. DeGray is editor-in-chief of Rejuvenation Research, uh, he's a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America and the American Aging Association. He's the author of The Mitochondrial Free Radical Theory of Aging and a co-author of Ending Aging. So um, so that's sort of, a, a sort of driving force in his research. And you may have read about uh, his work. He's been profiled in a number of articles and also a book called Long for This World by Jonathan Weiner. Um, but if you're not familiar with them, um, we can talk tonight a bit about basically what what's maybe you could sort of tell us about kind of the the overarching thrust of your of your work. What is what is your overall goal been of of all this work you've been doing at the Sense Research Foundation? 
Well, we have... Is this working? Good. Uh, we, we have, I guess, a spectrum of goals. Our main goal is simply to develop medicine that will keep people truly healthy, truly youthful, both mentally and physically, as long as they live. And we also have uh, an outreach and education goal, which is to get people to understand that this is not just some kind of fantasy, that this is a perfectly realistic medical um, uh, endeavor. And indeed, that the efforts that people make today to try to cure the diseases and disabilities of old age are basically never going to work unless and until we truly recognize that those diseases are part and parcel of one coherent, albeit chaotic, process, which is the process of aging. So um, is your goal to have people live a really satisfying life until they're 80, and then that's it? Or is your goal to have people live for you know, 200 years. What, what's, the, what's the goal? Or what do you think is practical based on what we know about a aging now? Our goal is simply to keep people healthy for as long as possible. However, we recognize that the main risk factor for dying is not being healthy. Therefore, <laughs> <laughs> right? Therefore, it shouldn't actually matter how long ago you were born. If you're truly mentally and physically youthful, the same way that typical 20 or 30 year olds are today, mm -hmm. then your risk of dying in the next year or the next 10 years should be the same as if you were actually born only 20 or 30 years ago, irrespective of how long ago you were actually born. So we don't see any inherent limit on this. But the key point is that this longevity benefit that we expect to arise from all this is a side effect. We don't work on longevity. We, d we certainly don't work on immortality, despite what you might read about me in the papers. Um, or m you might even have written about me in the papers, for all I know. Uh, um, um, Not um, me. Uh, 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 we, we work on health. Mm -hmm. and any longevity benefit, they're a side effect. Now, uh, are you finding a kind of, um, kind of an underlying uh, foundation to aging and the diseases of aging? Is there something you know, in particular that seems to be linking all these diseases together that you could target to, to deal with all of them? Yes and no. Aging is undoubtedly chaotic. It exists not because evolution has decided, decided that it's a good idea, that it somehow would increase our evolutionary fitness, but rather because evolution doesn't care enough. One of my colleagues once said it very succinctly. He said aging is a consequence of evolutionary neglect rather than <laughs> evolutionary intent. So this means that it's not an in, a, a unitary process, but at the same time, because it's such a gradual and systemic process, it means that the various components of it do interface with each other a great deal. And so it's no accident that we see that all of the aspects of accumulation of damage and eventual emergence and progression of pathologies happen at more or less the same age. So uh, should we be expecting, you know, clinical trials anytime s soon? Or, I mean, what, what sort of horizon do you see where uh, the research on, on the causes of aging and dealing with, with, with aging actually starts to, you know, we, wh when do we go from having, you know, uh, flies that live several weeks longer to people who are li living healthy lives longer? Mm. We believe that the way that medicine is eventually going to bring aging under control is by a panel of rejuvenation therapies. In other words, therapies that genuinely repair the molecular and cellular damage that the body has done to itself as a byproduct of its normal operation, even though, it's all, even though that damage has already occurred. We don't think that we're ever going to make all that much progress just by slowing down the, the creation of damage. We think that repair of damage is going to be the best way. And that means it's very much a divide and conquer strategy because there are lots of different types of damage. So there are already clinical trials for some of these types of damage. But in order to actually deliver truly substantial postponement of age-related ill health, we're going to have to get pretty much everything working reasonably well. And that's going to take, I would say, at least 20 or 25 years. And certainly for anything that far off, of course, it's extremely speculative to talk at that time frame at all. It could be 100 years. Mm. I, was, I was sort of curious what you thought about the movies because uh, a lot of them, you know, the, 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 the concept of time was being shown, expressed through development and growth and decay. Like, I th sometimes I think like our, 
a lot of our conceptions of time are basically kind of wrapped around our our mortality. Like we're sort of just we're aware that we're growing up and then that we're getting old and you know, that sort of drives our whole perception of time. I don't know. What do you think how do you think uh, what what does time mean to us? Well, the first thing I thought about the movies was I was re- uh, it was remarkable to me that so many of the people in them were English. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but um, my conception of time really I guess is a good a good question in terms of why I work on this and why such a ha- large proportion of the rest of the world is still so completely crazy and doesn't understand that aging is actually quite a bad thing and we really ought to do something about it. Um, uh, essentially, you know, it took me until I was nearly 30 before I even realized that the rest of the world didn't understand that aging was the world's most important problem. Um, and, it's take, uh, and eventually, as, as you mentioned earlier, I was a computer scientist. Eventually, I decided I had to switch fields and just sort of figure this out myself. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to me, it just makes no sense at all to think in terms of the, um, life, the natural cycle of life as having some inherent value. It seems to me that life is valuable in the present and in the future to the extent that one can actually have the physical and mental capacity to make the most of it, whether it's by enriching each other's lives or whatever. And that's what I want to maximize people's potential to do. So do do you think we would have a different experience of time if, you know, we were 100 years from now, like having conquered aging, as it were? like Well, I think in some ways we might. For example, we might be more risk-averse. Uh, I don't think this would be a big deal. I think we would just throw more money at the things that are risky that we do. Like we'd make safer cars. You know, We'd invest more in vaccine research, things like that. But I don't think it would really change our uh, way of looking at things. And in terms of our uh, sense of urgency, sense of, you know... Um, uh, whether it's worth getting things done. You know, some people say to me, well, we, they wouldn't, we wouldn't really care about getting anything done soon. And my, point, uh, well, my, 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 my response is, I, I say, okay, go back to the first time you got laid, okay? <laughs> and think about what was going through your head at the time. Were you actually thinking, you know, oh my God, oh my God, I have to get this person into bed right now because I've only got another 60 years to live? <laughs> you know? I mean, this is not the way we think, really. So I don't think there's going to be all that much difference. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, um, so, so Aubrey deals, you know, (laughs) on the scale of of several decades. Maybe, you know, some maybe someday we'll be, um, you know, talking about whether you who's going to live past 150. Who knows. but Rachel Sussman on the left, uh, on my far left, um, spends a, a lot of time with um, individuals, shall we say, for whom 150 years is really uh, not that much. They're just getting started. Um, I, I actually met uh, Rachel when um, she got in touch with me about this project she was doing, um, which eventually turned into a book that I wrote an introduction for. Um, a, a and it's the, the the book is called the the oldest living things uh, in the world, um, and it's published by University of Chicago Press. Um, when exactly did it come out? On Earth Day this uh, past year, April twenty second. So it came out in yeah. April. Um, so uh, she's also uh, spoken at uh, the TED main, main stage about her project at the Long Now Foundation. She uh, is a Guggenheim uh, McDowell Colony Fellow. Um, and she's a trained member of Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Corps. And uh, the book uh, was uh, f- featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, NPR's Picture Show. We're just taking a look at one of, of, of her pictures. Um, and um, but she was recently awarded the uh, LACMA Art and Tech Lab Grant to produce new work exploring deep time and deep space in conjunction with SpaceX and NASA JPL. And there's a solo exhibition of her work, including these pictures like this, uh, at Pioneer Works C- Center. I'm sorry, Pioneer Works Center for Art and Innovation in Red Hook, Brooklyn, from September 13th to November 2nd. So a couple more weeks of that, right? Yes, and if you come to the award ceremony um, on Thursday next week for the Imagine Science Film Festival, that is actually at Pioneer Works, so you can see my exhibition then as well. 
So, so you have been taking all these pictures of incredibly old things. So maybe you could just kind of explain to us how you de developed this idea slash obsession. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair. I've been doing this project for 10 years, so I guess that is a bit of an obsession. Um, so the project is really part art, part science, and part philosophical thinking about deep time. Um, so my background is as an artist, um, but I was making photographs about the relationship between humanity and nature, traveling quite a bit, and really searching for something. Um, I was looking actively to do an art and science project, and I'd also read a lot of philosophy as an undergrad, and I just had the sense that I wanted to do something transdisciplinary. Um, and I ended up um, on this, uh, adventure in Japan where I visited a supposedly 7,000 year old tree. It's not actually that old, um, but it was this incredible transformative um, journey for me. So um, the getting just getting the idea for the project was really a physical journey, but also a uh, an intellectual journey as well. Um, so I didn't have an epiphany in front of this tree, but it was actually a, a year maybe later, I was talking to some friends over dinner and all of a sudden I had my life light bulb moment where I realized all these things, um, you know, sometimes it's referred to as creative churn, all these things that I'd been thinking about for quite a long time just sort of snapped into focus. And one of the most important aspects of the Oldest Living Things Project was this idea of starting at year zero. So everything in, uh, in the project, the individual organisms are 2,000 years old and older. And this is precisely to put human time scales into perspective. That's a funny, <laughs> okay. That's a Shack Ernest Shackleton's grave with uh, a, an elephant seal guarding it. So that's not an oldest living thing. That's just there for color. Uh. <laughs> Well, I mean, what uh, I mean, can you sort of describe what it what it is about these incredibly old things that's so captivating for you? Sure. I mean, it's you know, it's really interesting for me because I began, you know, I didn't have training as a scientist, but I knew there was something really compelling about these organisms, and it was important to me also to define them as individuals. So I have both unitary and clonal organisms. Um, so. Uh, you know, the oldest unitary organism is the bristlecone pine that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, what How I did, old is that? Oh, so that's um, just over 5,000 years old. Um, a lot of people know the story of, of the tree that was cut down, if you heard the Radio Lab episode, uh, that was thought to be the oldest. The even the Methuselah tree is actually not the oldest living bristle cone, but this is a very carefully guarded secret that there are older bristle cones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, you know, Fernandez uh, make you know visualizing things that are happening, you know, second by second. Um, how do you how do you approach f photographing something that's incredibly old? I mean, is there is it do you just approach it as you would any landscape shot, or is there something special about how you approach these things? Well, what I tried to do was instead of thinking of them as landscapes is to think of them more as portraits um, because they are individuals, even the clonal organisms. Um, what was important to me was that, the, that they be genetically the same individuals as they were 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm just making a beautiful landscape, I was trying to capture something about the... I don't know if it's the essence of these things, but the reality of them as well. And there's something also about just the nature of photography. Photogra photography is very shallow time. It's a fraction of a second. And so you get this temporal tension between something that needed to exist ten or hundreds of thousands of years in order to witness it in this split-second moment to make an image of it. Uh, Aubrey, I was sort of wondering, I mean, when you look at these, uh, some of these incredibly old organisms, you know, thousands and thousands of years old, I mean, is, do, is there anything that uh, gerontologists can learn from these, these species that, you know, a 500-year-old clam, say, I mean, w w can we borrow their secrets or are they just too far off on the tree of life for us to even hope to emulate them? It's a great question, and, and certainly many gerontologists have been studying such organisms in order to see whether there is anything we can glean. In general, I think, um, unfortunately, you've got it. The things that are too far away on the tree of life um, have tended to, well, in one way or another, they don't have such a difficult aging problem as we have. For example, 
uh, any organism that doesn't have a clear distinction between the germline and the soma, the cells that give rise to the next generation and the ones that don't, they have a much, a, a much easier aging problem, or rather they have it easier for evolution to maintain the ability to keep all of the cells of the organism in good state rather than only the ones that are going to become the next generation. Similarly, um, organisms that don't have a central nervous system. That helps, you know. The central <laughs> so, um, Not something we want to emulate. Well, quite, yeah. I, 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 I went, I'm quite fond of my central nervous system, yeah. Um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the thing is that any organ that is that relies for its function on being composed of long-lived cells that are not dividing has a huge problem because cell division is a fantastically powerful rejuvenating process where you know, non-genetic damage that's accumulating is simply diluted away and genetic damage can be selected away, uh, whereas in the brain, for example, this is much less possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fernanda, I'm just curious, like how um, you know. Uh, so we've just gone from your, your wind map up to pictures that are you know thousands of years old. Um, do you see like sort of different strategies for visualizing different timescales? Like, are there are there ways to, to you know, to use d data differently if you're dealing with time different kinds of time? Yeah, definitely. I, I feel like. We, you know, we, we looked at the wind map. There's another one that I'd love to bring up if we yeah, still we'll have the her. slides. Um, Can we go back to hers? We'll give you a second. There was a next slide that had um, a circular visual. Yeah. Mm. So this so this is a visualization of the colors in the city of Boston over a whole year. Um, so this was basically we went to Flickr and downloaded all of the images that were public and under Creative Commons license of the Boston Common. The Boston Common is basically the Central Park of Boston. And because we were asked to visualize Boston, and we were like, how, how do you visualize a city? And then we thought, oh, the colors. Because seasons are so marked in Boston, if we can capture those colors over a, a whole year, then maybe there's something that we can capture about the city that would be interesting. And that's exactly what this is. So at the bottom there, you see January. That's where we have mm. heavy snow and we have a lot of whites and grays. If you go clockwise towards the top, on the top left, you see a little bit of magenta. Those are the flowers starting to bloom in the park. And then you have the bulges of green for the summer. And then if you go to the bottom right, you get a lot of the earthy to earth tones of, of fall. Um, so this, you know, a very different visualization from the wind map. It's static. It's trying to compress time. It's trying to compress one whole year into a single image. So yeah, I do think that there are different techniques and, and different, different inspirations also. The other thing about this that to me um, is quite interesting is that for some very specific reason, we decided to do it circularly, right? So one of the things is, how do you think about time? Do you think about time as a linear thing? Do you think about it being circular? In this case, because we were talking about something that is cyclical, it made a lot of sense for us to be thinking in this visual way, in this form. Wow, that's beautiful. Did, did you have any other images or was it? Um, no, I think this is, okay, yeah. great. Um, so why don't we um, take questions? Um, as, as I mentioned, the, the microphones are right there. So um, we we have people we you know, people up here who are working in all sorts of you know interesting different areas of time. And so wherever you want to go with this, just please ask. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, all the movies, all the films were really quite remarkable. But I'm wondering how each of you or any of you feel about music and affect in the film and content. So it seemed like the gravity of mountains was perhaps the most concentrated in information and lack of affect. And what does it do for your perspective? How did you experience the films in terms of affect and lack of affect? So thoughts about music in, in combining with these images and, and how music sort of helps us to sort of think about time? Um, well, I mean, I find it really interesting just as an artist myself, just thinking about um, communicating science information. And that's something that I've thought about quite a lot. And where d and it's where do you find the balance between providing information, visualizing something, or creating 
that other layer with the the music, which really is about mood and tone. And you know, certainly everybody making the films that we saw today had different ideas about what their goals were. So. Um, in a sense, it's uh, and it was fascinating for me actually as uh, on the j being on the jury, being able mm. to see such a wide range of films and also comparing genres, like looking at a documentary film um, next to an animation. Where these are things that you wouldn't normally compare, but the science is the common thread between them. Um, mm. So that's all. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. I was just going to say I'm always envious of people who have the ability to use audio. Um, I This is something we want to do, we haven't done yet, but we would love to do. And one of the things that I think inspi it, it made me realize how much of a difference it makes is when the wind map, wind map came out, people started making movies of the wind map. Uh, and so if you go to YouTube, there's a bunch of movies of the wind map, and a lot of times they would have audio, and I'm like, oh, that's what we're missing, you know? And so I feel like, yeah, definitely, it's, it's as, as Rachel was saying, it's, it's a layer of, of so, m you know, it, it's emotional, it's, there, there's a lot into it. Um, in terms of data, because I am constantly thinking about data, there's also the notion of, well, could you sonify the data that you're dealing with? And I think there, we haven't made as much progress as, as would be nice. Uh, I, I, I feel envious of people who can use either audio or visual uh, <laughs> methods. Cause, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is really something that I've n has never been a strength of mine, and I find it extremely gratifying that I'm able to work with people who are much better at it than me, because obviously the work I'm doing, I'm fundamentally doing it for humanitarian reasons, and it needs to be communicated to the public, not only in order to make it happen more quickly, but also in order to get people to understand how important it is. So the ability to use other techniques than simply the spoken or written word um, to actually get that across is extraordinarily valuable, and you know I wish I were better at it myself. Do you d are there any do you have like favorite movies uh, about that sort of capture, you know the the you know aging you know and the and and the issues of aging? I mean, no. Would there be an arb no? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 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 the, the do they the get? Do they all get it horribly wrong? That the sounds the like a call for entries. <laughs> the, 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 the treatment, the treatment of uh, of the of a post aging world in film and also in literature, for that in scientific literature, is absolutely irredeemable. What's an it, example? It, 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 it makes my life incredibly much harder. Because so like, what's a movie that just drives you up the wall? Oh, well, let's say um, Logan's Run. What I say? Logan's Run, just to Logan's say. Logan's Run, oh um, yeah, the know, 70s classic, right? Or, or in time, you know, the capitalist version of Logan's Run. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's basically, you know, it's all about setting up some kind of scenario in which you have some completely arbitrary and uncriticized uh, dystopia, um, you know, and you just make some kind of dramatic element out of that. You know, and people go away with their feeling entrenched that actually aging is not such a problem after all, and I have to, and, and I take it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I, w I just wanted to make one more. Yeah. Yeah, that question just reminded me of this another um, sound issue and in my own work. And this is my one of the very few regrets I have about um, my oldest living things work is that I wish I was taking I had taken field recordings of the sound, not so much video, but as I've um, started to share the images in the gallery setting, I wish you could put on the headphones and hear what it sounded like at each of those locations. So mm. I'll mm. think about that when I'm working on my project about space. Wh what is your project about space? Um, I Can shouldn't have brought it up. I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is, it, it, you does say that you're, you know, in your bio that you're exploring deep time. So you're going even beyond millennia now, right? Yeah, that's true. So there are a couple of the organisms that I photographed for the oldest living things, um, one of the best examples of the stromatolites, I started... Uh, tell uh, us what they so are. So, sorry, the stromatolites... No, not everybody knows about the not stromatolites. Not everybody, true. Probably. So stromatolites are bound cyanobacteria. So they're made up of um, living bacteria and non-living sediments like silt and sand. And they are one of the earliest, if not the earliest, forms of life on Earth that we know of. Um, and, this, and they first formed around 3.5 billion years ago. And this was a first for me to start really thinking back into these incredibly, really 
transformative deep time scales. Um, also, one of my favorite facts um, in doing this research is I learned that the stromatolites oxygenated the planet, and it took 900 million years. So the next time you take a breath, thank a stromatolite. Um, but this got me thinking about deep time and deep space, and it's something that I really am just starting to scratch the surface of. You know, we they didn't teach quantum mechanics in art school. Uh, so, um, but I've been spending some time with different types of scientists, so from particle physicists to cosmologists, and we'll most likely make something like a light installation about dead stars or maybe a data visualization, but it's really the concept of time that is the most important factor for me. I find that it's um, just, I, I just don't, I, I, it's interesting how just how feeble our brains are at, at dealing with those time scales. It's just we stick zeros at the end of numbers, and that's the best we can do. Well, absolutely, and I think that's one reason why it's so wonderful for art to embrace these kind of scientific problems, because they're really physiological problems as well. We get to a point where we just don't comprehend the vastness of these time scales. And you know, sometimes science and sometimes it's art that allows us a window of experiencing these times. It's sometimes hard to hold on to them, but it can be a glimpse of something that's far beyond our physical capabilities. Yeah, I, in working on um, like a, a tech evolution textbook I, I co-wrote, we did we were trying to show a timeline of life on Earth, and it's just it's just it's a design nightmare. I mean, you got to fix it. I mean, because <laughs> it's just it's horrible. Because yeah, it's like you know, Earth forms 4.5 billion years ago, early signs of life about three and a half billion years ago. Nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, like a billion years ago, something interesting happens. Not much. Not 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 much in our world view of things. And then, oh look, animals. And then and and then, but then, like in just the past few million years, things just take off. To us, a million years is inconceivable, and you can't even fit it all on the on the page. It's a, it's, and yet, yeah, the, you know, time just goes so far before that in terms of life on Earth. We, we have a question here. Hey, thank you guys. Uh, my name is Alex. Um, I know we, we've been dealing with a lot of different time scales tonight. I'm interested lately in um, time management. And um, <laughs> I'm also interested in uh, whether it's science or, or art um, or business, any field. Um, we often run up against political time, uh, things like um, Elections, for instance, the the the, sick, the cycles that we deal with in in our daily lives end up determining how we get things done, and I wonder if you can speak to some of the challenges of doing science and art and other things, given um, something like politics, which tends to ignore the long term and the long now, um, and tends to focus maybe more on the immediate, and how that impacts and changes the way that we do those things. Well, I can certainly speak to that in regard to science. Uh, it's a complete disaster. Uh, the, the whole system of funding of science from uh, the government, and also, for that matter, from foundations, really, but especially from the government, is absolutely um, beset by the um, impossibility to do high-risk, high-gain work. High-risk work, of necessity, often fails. And it often takes a long time to demonstrate whether it's failing or succeeding. And you just can't get funding for long enough to do those things. The reason I ended up choosing to go in the direction of setting up a foundation was precisely to avoid this, to bring in philanthropic funds that were able to be used on really quite difficult projects that lots of people know are really important, but they don't do them because they can't. So this is a project, I mean, you're working on a project that is sort of, it's a big project, so by definition, you're working on a long time scale. You well, can't be like going every two years and hoping, fingers crossed, you're going to get yeah, a grant. Yeah, I, I meant a little more than that. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, obviously, the overall project is extraordinarily ambitious, but the components of it, the individual research themes that we're following, are themselves very ambitious. And, you know, we get papers out, same as anybody else, but we don't work on a, on a publish or perish mentality where we have to get a paper out every 10 minutes. 
Um, there's actually somebody here, one of our uh, best researchers, is over in the corner over there. She's been working at Albert Einstein over the past few years, and she's um, the, the work that she's been doing has come to fruition now after a much longer period than you would normally be able to have as a postdoc. So, mm -hmm. uh, were you going to say something, Rachel? I was going to say a lot of things. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, my, my first response to that question is that just fundamentally long-term thinking is so vital and is so absent. I mean, long-term thinking, you can apply it to just about anything and it will benefit from it. In fact, I can't think of an, e I challenge anybody to think of an example where that would be a negative. Um, and yet that's something that's so um, outside of the way we live our lives, no matter what we're doing. You know, as, as they say at the long now, we're caught in the five minutes ago, five minutes from now. And that kind of narrow thinking is just so detrimental in any field. It's not just art or science, although artists and scientists, I think, face a number of the same challenges as well, certainly in getting funding and in following rote methodologies, which can be problematic and you end up missing the forest for the trees. Um, but just in general, integrating that long-term thinking, I d it's something that would benefit Everybody, and it's also something you know. We think about issues like climate change, which is certainly something that is you know part of my work as well. But we think um, one of the other issues is our perception. So climate change—it's taken so long for us um, in uh, the, for the general population to understand that climate change is happening mm -hmm. because we say, well, I don't know. It's pretty cold today, so climate change isn't happening. Mm -hmm. And so it's this narrow time scale that's actual, and our per and just. Um, using our perception as our primary tool um, can be I just want to uh, ask Fernanda real quick before we get to uh, the next question. I mean, uh, I, I would think that ter in terms of, you know, computational design, you, you are sort of dealing with kind of the flip side of this, which is that you are get have these tools that are getting more, more and more and more powerful. I mean, like, doing something like that would be inconceivable just a few years ago. So how do you sort of um, keep... Uh, you know, using, how do you keep thinking in terms of the things you can do with the tools you, that you've just gotten your hands on? Yeah, so I, I was just thinking in terms of, of, of the question that I definitely see an arc. Um, and so I've, I've been working with data visualization for like 10 years now. And it's really um, exciting to see how far we've we've come in the following sense, not only the technology itself, you're saying the machines are getting better, the graphics cards are getting better, and that's all great and wonderful. But one of the things that I think to me is, is the most important is the difference in culture. So um, when I first started working with visualization, and that's definitely true before I even started, um, it used to be this very academic discipline. And it used to be serious technology for serious people, scientists, experts, um, government, um, the military. And now it's becoming more and more of a mainstream medium. So the New York Times itself, it's, it's doing hugely pioneering work in covering news with data and doing interactive data visualization. And, and one of the things that is really exciting to see is that if you talked about, I, I have friends in journalism, and they would constantly tell me, if you talked about having the kinds of displays that we have today, five years ago, editors would be like, you're crazy. Nobody's going to understand this. Nobody's going, you're, you're putting hundreds of numbers in front of people. Nobody's going to forget, forget this. You need to give me one average, and that's it. And I feel like the fact that we are We've come a long way. The fact that we now shower uh, regular readers, regular people, people who are not, not experts with data and visualization being a, part, a big part of this is, is really exciting. So to me, it's sort of taking a broad um, view of, of time, in, in my field at least. Great. Um, before we uh, get to the next question, um, we got five minutes. So let's, let's make this the last question and just sort of give an extended answer. Uh, <laughs> my name is Farzad, and uh, Rachel, I wanted to um, take on your challenge. And uh, I remember seeing your book. Actually, we had lunch at the last one of these film things um, at some Spanish restaurant. I didn't realize that until a minute ago. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, you wanted to you know, challenge us to think what would not benefit from uh, long-term thinking, very long-term thinking. And the first thing that pops into my mind is uh, basically youth, spontaneity, 
that sense that uh, you know, of play that people have that you know in the instant, the moment, um, and that's a great thing. And, and of course, I agree with everything you're saying about long-term thinking. All of you are saying about. So I was thinking, you know, what could be the cross section between those where you preserve that um, that vital freshness of just the very momentary, and yet uh, the long, long, long term. And uh, as I was thinking of that, Fernanda just said something that <laughs> kind of answered that in a way that volume of data that you get where you're getting, it's not long term, well, it's, it could be long term in time, but it's just this vast amount, but in one frame, like at an instant. Um, that kind of is the, the cross-sectional thing that, that communicates a lot. So uh, things like that would be of just wonderful to uh, collect. Uh, and so the other thing that occurred to me was sampling time. When you have really long time, like that evolution thing you were talking about, Carl, um, where you take the cuts makes a difference. So if you do have vast amounts of time and you want to condense them into something smaller, where you take your samples makes a lot of difference, uh, whether it's linear or nonlinear or, or what choice you make. It's a selectivity that uh, that we like to ha we say artists have, for example. You don't, we don't know how they get that selection, but when they get it, it's just really good. So that's a second example of this cross-sectional, mm, very momentary, very long thing. That um, anyway, anything like that is is what I'm uh, thinking might be an answer to your challenge. Would be good to hear. So uh, I mean, how yeah how. Um, how do we sort of deal with sort of the long term with our kind of little short term minds? You know, I mean, how do we how do we deal with that? <laughs> okay, I mean, I think we're never going to tamp out, stamp down our, our short term minds. That will always be there. We'll always be reactive. We are physical. The word emotional. Um, I think that the long term thinking is sort of a counterpoint to that. We don't stay in it. We don't stay in deep time. We visit it. And these are tools that art and the si and and data visualization. These are all tools where we can visit deep time. Um, in terms of long term thinking, I'm sure we've all made decisions in in our youth where we felt like you know we maybe could have used a little bit of long term thinking before doing whatever it was that was. So um, yeah, I'm still going to stand by my statement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think there's so much of a dichotomy as all as all that. I think I think it comes down perhaps to the need to prioritize so um well i mean obviously i've made one joke about this already to do with uh, to do with having sex so let's talk about the other end of that let's talk about menopause so um <laughs> um so um as we all know as uh, society has become more prosperous more uh, w one nation after another has gone through a massive um uh, decline in fertility rates in the average number of children that women have and simultaneously, when a society does that, it always also goes through a transition where women on average have their children later. But of course, only a little bit later because it's then or never when, it, when menopause comes along. That's one of the things we're going to be fixing. Uh, for those of you who are looking forward fixing to menopause... So, so menopause will be a thing of the past? Well, for those say? of you who are looking forward to menopause, I should point out that we're going to be able to turn it on and off. But... Um, uh, but well, wait, 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 uh, but... <laughs> uh, uh, but no, no, let me, let me just come to, the, come to the point. The thing is, this is likely to give a great deal more time to have kids, but that's not going to make it like less, po more necessary to ha engage in long-term thinking. Rather, it's going to make it more possible to engage in short-term thinking or long-term thinking to the extent that you like. It's going to expand our freedom of choice to have the best of both worlds, if you like. But... Um, uh, but are, are, our, are, are our brains still going to be kind of locked into the sort of, you know, the short-term thinking that was very good before, you know, antibiotics and language and, you know, everything else? Well, we certainly don't see any sign of having any difficulty getting used to living 20 or 30 years longer than we used to. So it's not obvious that we ever will. Although, I mean, I just have to wonder about just the physicality, physicality, like how we're able to process these numbers. So when we're talking about 
a 20 year difference, even a 50 year difference. These are something that we can physically relate to. And then once we start getting out to these higher numbers, whether it's a thousand, 10,000, a billion years ago, we stop having anything that's physically relatable to us. Well, well I think you've put your finger on it by talking about years ago. The, the point is that if we're talking about subjective experience of this or um, anticipation of it, then the critical fact is that we're still only going to be going only going to be getting older at one year per year. Whatever happens, we're not going to have any two hundred year old people for at least another hundred years. You know, whatever happens, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and lots of other stuff happens in a hundred years, right? So, I don't really think it's going to be a major driver of the way that life is. And if we use some long-term thinking to deal with climate change, the planet will be a whole lot nicer for those 200-year-old people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I guess I think we have to wrap it up. So uh, I'd like to thank our panelists and uh, thank you all for your attention. So we have a re reception. Um, so every if anybody wants to uh, stay for a little longer. We have, uh, we have to leave at 10, so just enjoy the last 45 minutes of the night and don't think too much about time.